This is the Business of Apps podcast, bringing you actionable insights from the leaders of the global app industry and the world's fastest growing apps. You can find more app news, data and analysis over at businessofapps.com. Welcome to the Business of Apps podcast. On this show, we invite app industry professionals to cover various topics. We promise to do our best to keep it both insightful but brief. In this episode, we have Daniel Chernohovsky, Managing Director, EMEA at App Lovin. Daniel, welcome to the Business of Apps podcast. Hey, uh, thanks for inviting me on. Great. Okay. Uh, since the time when Apple pioneered the App Store back in 2008, the app industry has grown into a huge community of millions of app developers. Some of them indie who are putting their time, money, and sweat into creating something beautiful and useful for people. Some are big app powerhouses that churn up app updates on a weekly basis and push their financial envelope every quarter. The common thing for both is that they're in business to make a profit. They may sell paid apps, they may go with an app purchases subscription model, and sure thing, they run ads and sell their apps to generate revenue. In this episode, we have Daniel to talk about in-app bidding, one of the central components of how app revenue is being generated with ads. But as always on the show, let's talk about you, Daniel, first. Tell us about yourself. Sure. Thanks so much for the intro. So yeah, my name is Dan Chanowski. I run the European business of AppLovin. For those of you guys who don't know AppLovin, AppLovin is one of the largest growing game companies in the world. I initially started off as an ad network and also run a navigation platform, which I think we'll be talking about in a bit more detail later on. I've been with the company for five years now. It's my first job in ad tech. I had a couple of jobs beforehand in offline publishing as well as app development. And yeah, found out about the app opportunity about five years ago and been with the company since then. I love it. Oh, yeah. Speaking of app development, let's talk a little bit more about the company. What you guys do and what is your mission statement? Sure. So I think our goal uh, is to entertain the world with games, with games that are providing interesting content and are connecting people. This is the idea. We therefore partner with studios. And I think some of your listeners might have seen games like Wordscapes or Game of War, uh, Clockmaker, or maybe a game by Line Studio, which are basically our, our gaming outlets. At the same time, we also have platform and product solutions. So I initially started working, or I'm still working for the ad network side of the business. The ad network is essentially the side that allows gaming developers, outside gaming developers, to monetize their titles, but also mm-hmm. acquire new users and grow the user base by user acquisition. Yeah, that's a good summary. I'm sure many people should be familiar with App Love, and you guys are one of the biggest ad networks out there. As I summarized in the intro, when it comes to generating revenue with an app, so developers have a choice between paid model, in app purchases, subscription, and advertising. So let's talk about how advertising in apps works, what methods for programmatic buying and selling those ads are available for app developers. Sure thing. So maybe to take a step back, uh, you guys think about how ads are actually displayed. In the game, I think most of us will be familiar with three formats. The format is either a banner, which is a small ad that is displayed underneath the actual app itself. There are interstitials, which are ads that are shown in between, let's say, you have levels in the game, and then every other level you will see an interstitial. And the last format, which is very popular, is called the rewarded ad, which is an optional ad that the user might choose to watch to get this type of reward, whether it's coins or a level of progression, maybe a new outfit, something along those lines. So these are the formats. And obviously, the way that the industry works is that you will work with a variety of partners. You don't just work with AppLovin or just work with Facebook, but you want to work with everyone if you want to monetize. Because the idea is that you have this inventory available to display ads, and now you want to get the highest price point and the best fitting ads for users. And for that, you work with a variety of partners. Facebook, Google, ourselves, Unity, some other partners. And then you need a system that will basically decide when to show which network, who has the most competitive price point. And this is what we call mediation or the competition between networks. And yeah, that's, I I think, what we're going to be talking about more today. Right, exactly. So this is a good segue to my next question, which is there's several models for programmatic advertising. And one of those, like I I think the original model is Waterfall. What is pros and cons? And because there are more uh, advanced uh, newer models, do you see any benefits for keeping this particular model in use down the road? 
Well, sure. So I think the the base idea has always been okay. If I have competition between a couple of very, a couple of companies or a couple of bidders, the very simple idea is how do I get the highest price point for mm-hmm. an app, right? So this yeah. idea is has been tackled in a very variety of ways, and the waterfall model is essentially the closest that we historically were able to get to the notion of. Every network, what's the highest price point you can get? Are you willing to pay for this particular user to show them an ad? Uh, give them your highest price point, and now the winner gets the impression. We haven't had this model up until recently, so the way to get as close as possible to it was to use a so-called waterfall. The waterfall was the idea that you ask networks consecutively whether they're willing to pay a certain price. So let's say are you watch an ad, you, you, wanna, you play an, ad, an app, and you want to watch a rewarded video. So now a request is sent to, let's say, Facebook first. And Facebook says, are you willing to pay $50 CPM, which means $0.05 cents for this impression? Are you willing to pay $0.05 cents or $50 CPM to show this ad to art? And then Facebook will look at it and say, well, based on all the information they have, I'm not willing to pay $50 CPM. So then it goes on to the next network, which is maybe set at $45. And the next mm-hmm. network gets some 40 and so on and so forth. This is the waterfall. The request falls down from one network to the other, from one price point to the other. This is as close as we've been able to get to a perfect auction, to perfect competition historically. And it's been a vastly advantageous model since it came out a couple of years ago. The problem in it, however, is that there are some inefficiencies. The first one is, let's say you ask 50, 40, 30 as an example. Uh-huh. Maybe someone would have been able to give to pay $45, but you've never asked for those 45 Right. So obviously right. the solution will be now be very easy to say, okay, I'm gonna ask 50, 49, 48, 47, and so on. But you can't do that because obviously every time the server, like the server of let's say your mediation and Facebook and your mediation and awesome tracks, it takes time. So maybe you've seen it before in an app where you open an app and you want to watch a video that says no video available at this time. And that's precisely from this your waterfall is too long and it takes too much time to load an ad. So by the time that the user wants to see an ad, there's none available. Right, so because of that, you have to have these bigger gaps, the 50, 40, 35, 30, and so on. Right. So the problem is, right, there are price points that are being missed. That's the one issue. The second issue is that there is a sort of randomness to how you select whom to put where. Why is, let's say, Facebook sitting at 50 and Google at 45 and Apple at 40? Why is an Apple open at 50, Google at 45, and Facebook at 40, right? There's some randomness mm-hmm. and you have to experiment and find the right order, so to speak. And the model definitely works. But as I said, these inefficiencies are significant. So for us, for us, as we kind of went more into gaming, and as we uh, started developing ad-driven business models, it was very important to find out a solution or figure out a solution to these inefficiencies. All right, gotcha. So it looks like the waterfall model was like these relatively simplest case like it was a either like you have to create you have to start with something and that model was even though it was less sophisticated but it was you know a model to start with to go forward and you know allow owners to generate revenue with their inventory but now mm-hmm. we're going to the second stage the more advanced model which is header beating which have, if i remember correctly this is something that came from desktop right Tell me about these pros, cons, and the level of adoption of this model in the industry. Absolutely. So, uh, yes, you're completely right. It was initially desktop has been, when it comes to ad monetization, desktop has been a bit more advanced for the simple reason that in desktop you show banners, you don't show videos. These are formats that are slightly easier to work with just because the file sizes are smaller as well. But basically, yes, the in-app bidding is header bidding in desktop on mobile, it's called in-app bidding, is the idea that we kind of discussed in the beginning, which is, okay, five people are competing for my impression. What is the highest price point that each and every one of you is willing to pay? And I will take the one that pays the highest point. This is the idea. It's a real, real-time real auction that runs in parallel rather than consecutively in a waterfall. And you basically eliminate these gaps that you have in your water for up to 50 and 40, you know, gap in between. You also eliminate the randomness of who gets to show an impression when or who gets requested when, because you run a real-time auction in parallel with everyone. That's the idea of in-app bidding. It started to come around a little under two years ago. I think ourselves and Facebook were kind of the first companies to really push it. We had at that stage acquired a solution called Max which is now part of our product offering mm-hmm. and currently is probably the largest in-app bidding mediation in the world. 
We'd acquired it precisely for that. We wanted to push the envelope for in-app bidding forward, obviously for our own portfolio of games, but also for all the partners that we've been working with. So over the last two years, obviously a lot of uh, improvements have been made. Facebook has been bidding uh, successfully. Uh, we're bidding successfully. More and more networks have been added. Mintigro is an example. Act for me, Tapture. There are many partners that are now bidding. And it's become sort of of a calling card for industry. So regardless of, let's say, the mediation provider that you talk to, all of them will be working towards a bidding solution. The advantages of it are clear. The improvements are significant. Like we've also seen uplifts of 20 to 25% in ARPTEL. ARPTEL is a metric of the average revenue per daily active user, so how much money you make on average per user. And the uplifts have been pretty significant. If we talk about the current adoption, it's a process that takes a while. So to put that in context, let's say it's not like you could just switch on the bidder and that's it. Networks mm-hmm. that historically have been working on Waterfall have to change their tech stack to support this notion of bidding, right? Because in yeah. essence, it's a slightly different question that you're now asking. You're not saying, are you willing to pay $40? You're saying, what's the most you're willing to pay? So the tech has to be adopted to it. And currently, I'd say if we look at Max, which, as I said, is one of the largest sources for internet bidding, we currently have close to half of our revenue. So the revenues that partners generate within our mediation coming from bidding. This being only two years in, I think is already a pretty strong case. Essentially, for the networks that allow bidding, such as, as I said, ourselves, Facebook, et cetera, every partner essentially adopts to bidding if they have, or every developer adopts to bidding if they have the opportunity for it. Not everyone is there yet. Some of the networks are in the process of working out their own bidder technology, but I think it is a matter of time. So it's a matter of time, and for ad networks, uh, it's a matter of uh, you know both uh, doing the financial calculations and be cautious there, and just technical obstacles that they have to overcome to make it work, right? Exactly. I mean, the the financial upside, I think, is pretty clear because I think if you look at it from a network perspective, the one thing that you always want is fair access, right? You want mm-hmm. to be able that if you can give the developer the highest price point, if you can pay the developer the most money, then you should be able to get that impression. This is what every network wants. It's just fair and transparent competition. I think in a bidding is the best and it is the way there. All right. So... This is how uh, kind of a hypothetical question. If you could be in a position to develop a new method, a new model for in-app advertising, how would it look mm-hmm. like? So to be quite honest with you, I think I'd much rather, like, I'd love to see the world in which we live in a year or two, hopefully where the whole industry has moved to in-app bidding. The main reason for me is that once we get there, I think the the skills of a developer, of a game developer, will focus again mostly on developing amazing games. Because right now, some gaming companies will produce great games, but they don't have the expertise, the time, the connections to build these advantageous uh, waterfalls or these advantageous in a bidding solutions, so to speak. And it will create, let's say, a competitive disadvantage. And I think we believe that at the end of the day, the thing that will des- should decide how well a game works is the game itself. And I think once we get to this full in-app bidding adoption, which I hope will happen in the next year or two, I think it will kind of create, let's say, a fair playing field between all game devs. Gotcha, Daniel. Well, speaking of the world we're living in, we're living in a brave world of COVID-19. Can you tell us about how this pandemic has influenced the programmatic advertising in apps? For sure. So I, I think we have to different, uh, differentiate a little bit between gaming and non-gaming. I mean, if we think mm-hmm. about gaming, what you will see essentially is that most of the ads that are shown in gaming are game ads themselves, right? And I think we've seen it with the stock price of Netflix and all entertainment companies going up in the last three months. Essentially, people have been spending their time being glued more to their devices, playing more, being entertained more. So we've definitely seen an uptick in, let's say, time spent on mobile devices. So it's it's hard to say, okay, there's been one singular effect because many things basically happen at once. And it's also true that a lot of brand advertisers have lowered the spend for a while. But at the same time, gaming itself is an ecosystem that lives a lot from gaming. If you if you watch uh, if you play a gaming app, you'll see that most ads within that app will also come from gaming, right? So ourselves as a gaming company, but also as a network, we've seen essentially we've seen stable progression we've been growing for a long time and have continued to do so the industry as a whole is but as much as ourselves sure there have been initially that we've seen some dips in ad ecpm so the revenue that you get per impression particularly on banners for example which is something that is more brand dependent but that has essentially picked up again 
So because the games is like the major driver for Epic system, even though big brands kind of pulled off their advertising budgets from uh, ad networks, but games are still in. That's why you don't feel, you don't see that much of an effect, right? Exactly. I think gamers will continue to play. And I think if anything, we, we've expanded over the last couple of years. I think mobile has done an amazing job in showing that everyone can be a gamer. And I think that has shown true to it again over the last couple of months. Gotcha. Now we're in the segment of the show when I'm asking kind of a few quick questions to the guests so we can get a better picture of who he is. Sure. Uh, are you iOS or Android person? I'm an iOS person. All right, I'm uh, <laughs> I'm keeping the list of the question, the answers on this question. <laughs> and the, so far, the iOS stack is bigger. Okay. All right, good. moving forward, what was your first mobile phone? My first mobile phone was a Nokia. I think it was called a 5510, which was like the 3310, but it had a, a extra hard plastic shell because my parents were sure that I would drop it constantly. Uh, so I had like an extra layer of protection, which helped, to be honest. Sure, sure thing. I, I, I have an impression that Nokia has the most vivid memories for all folks who are coming on the show. Like, Absolutely. Uh, from th th those days, Nokia was the clear, the king of the market. I mean, look, uh, everyone was a gamer back then. Everyone was playing Snake. Yeah, that was the game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, getting back to 2020, what is your favorite app now and why? So last couple, uh, last week plus, I've been pretty hooked on a game called Trivia Royale. You guys might have seen it in the charts. It's basically a competitive trivia game. I'm, I really like trivia games. I've been playing a lot of Quest Duo and also games like Wordscapes uh, during the um, during the pandemic times, let's say. Uh, but yeah, I'm pretty hooked on it. It has a friends themed quiz, which uh, which I've been playing a lot. All right, cool. When you look on your at your smartphone, the apps you have, is there any technology you're kind of waiting for? to make those apps more useful for you. What kind of app technologists are you most excited about? What are you waiting for? Sure. I think what's going to be really interesting is with, let's say, the adoption of 5G over the next couple of months or next year, also with Apple releasing the new iPhone as 5G support. I think mm -hmm. multiplayer games can become more in-depth. And I'm kind of excited. So I've been, I've spent a lot of time playing PUBG in my life. And I'm just kind of curious to see what these games, the multiplayer games, the more complex multiplayer games will be able to do with... Um, quicker broadband. So that's something I'm excited for. I see. All right. Before I let you go, how can people know more about what you do? Absolutely. So you guys can always go on our, everyone can go on our website. We publish a lot of case studies with companies that we work with as well as our internal studios. We also have a series called Ask the Developer, which shares a lot of insights from monetization, but also from creatives um, and other aspects, let's say, of game dev. So I think those are two good sources of knowledge about what we guys do. Great. That's terrific. Thanks so much for your time and coming on the podcast, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you, Art. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. And that was Daniel Chernohovsky, Managing Director in me at AppLovin. To listen to more episodes, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. Just search for Business of Apps and you will find us easily. Once you subscribe, you will be able to get new episodes on your smartphone, tablet, or computer as soon as we release them. And please don't forget to leave us a review and comment. It is highly appreciated. And all episodes will also be available on businessofapps.com. See you next week. Bye. This is the Business of Apps podcast, bringing you actionable insights from the leaders of the global app industry and the world's fastest growing apps. You can find more app news, data, and analysis over at businessofapps.com. Thank you for listening to the Business of Apps podcast. For more, head on over to businessofapps.com.